Hello and welcome. I'm Nicole DeVent. Today I'm re-recording a Zoom lecture on esoteric astrology that was held on July 31st at the Theosophical Society in Seattle. Thank you to everyone that tuned in and my sincere apologies for the audio that was cutting out during that lecture. Today, I'm re-recording it so that you have the information that I was hoping to share to everyone that day. Thanks for tuning back in. I grew up in Austin, Texas when it truly was weird. <laughs> My grandmother would take me with her to psychic readings with Mrs. Saldana and there were astrology books around my house. So I can't tell you exactly when I began studying and practicing astrology, but at this point, it is the framework I have for life. <laughs> and so today we're going to go into my growing understanding of esoteric astrology, but I have a very intuitive approach to um, astrology readings for others. I will go through the 12 signs of the zodiac and share my interpretation of them through an esoteric astrology lens. And I sincerely hope you receive something that supports your growth and connection to your soul's journey, but you already know your truth. So trust your instincts and take whatever resonates and leave the rest. I'm merely another individual on the path trying to discern and convey messages of my truth. And I hope you find this as fascinating and helpful as I do. Hermes Trismegistus, more widely known as the Greek messenger god Hermes, and also the Egyptian god Thoth. You've probably heard this as, as above, so below. One thing I love about this quote that is often missing in as above, so below, is the last section. To accomplish the miracles of the one thing. Hmm. We often miss that, but this is the reference of the human existence that's reflected in the universe as the seen and unseen energies, stars, and other geometric points above move, transform, and evolve, so do we. We are, in fact, one with the heavens and earth, at least on an energetic and subatomic level. An astrological chart is merely a 2D map of the sky at your birth. Astrology is an ancient science, and some of the earliest fragments of astrological tablets were found in Mesopotamia and dated back to 2300 BCE. Of course, astrology was used prior to that, but these are the first historic documents. So this clay tablet, also called a planisphere, is a cuneiform representation of the night sky over Nineveh and dated to January 3rd through 4th in 650 BCE. So Nineveh is now northern Iraq and once was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. There is a rectangular shape at the top that is identified as the constellation we now know as Gemini and stars contained with an, within an oval shape are the Pleiades. Fast forward a couple thousand years, and here we have an image titled The Great Art of Light and Shadow. Of course, that's translation of Ars Magna Lucis Ambrae. The astrologers from early on assigned certain body parts and organs to planets and drawings like this one were prevalent, especially during the Middle Ages. This sundial of celestial medicine from this piece was created in 1646 by the Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher. Here's an example of an astrology chart with all the planets represented at the time of birth in their specific astrological signs. And I know everybody uses apps now that don't look at this circle, but I love the way this circle shows the evolution of the existence. And it also shows the sign on the horizon. If you imagine that you are the center of this chart, as your birthplace is the location on the earth at the center of this chart, and the sign on the horizon is your rising sign and ascendant, it is also a really important important aspect to esoteric astrology. 
Esoteric astrology considers the rising sign as the most important point, actually, because it is the entrance of spirit in the East. And here we have spirit representing the soul. Now, the sun sign is similar to traditional astrology. It is the vehicle of the personality in this lifetime. And while essential and useful, the idea for esoteric astrology is to blend that energy with the soul. And the moon is a in esoteric astrology is more of a malefic and, and represents the past that we need to move on from kind of a been there, done that kind of thing. Let's move on from that. It's a little too comfortable. <laughs> so again, the East is the place of the rising sun and the entry point of spirit. This is the higher knowledge and vibration of the soul. And that's at the heart of esoteric astrology. And of course, you do need an exact time of birth to find your rising sign or ascendant. You'll hear me reference personality based or exoteric rulers. And this is the typical sun sign astrology that most of us have absorbed in books, apps and over cold beverages on bar stools, possibly. Um, <laughs> it describes this life journey. And for instance, what kind of work you're inclined to do or where you, when your love life is going to heat up, um, how you get along with your mother or the challenges to getting along with your mother, that is all represented in exoteric astrology. And in esoteric astrology, we have more information that is the higher path, the inward journey that you are taking this lifetime. Possibly you have heard it called soul centered astrology or spiritual astrology. These are all other terms that people use for esoteric astrology. Spiritual astrology or esoteric astrology endeavors to understand the lesson and requires the individual to implement new choices that align with your soul's path. It also views a journey of the soul in multiple lifetimes or dimensions. There's a wide range of esoteric teachings in the Theosophical Library and bookstore, and they deal with the evolution of soul consciousness through planetary energies and their living archetypes, at least esoteric astrology does. And it's all part of the ageless wisdom teachings of H.P. Blavatsky. And specifically, this quote you see is from Alice Bailey's five volume set treaties on the seven rays, one of which is esoteric astrology. And she channeled this from Tibetan Master DK. Basically, it's saying that when you are unconscious of your condition and you, you can be completely controlled by the stars and the planets. And, and I quote, the moment that man becomes aware of his own soul and is endeavoring to control his own path in life, the man then becomes receptive to the subtler and higher energies of the solar system. So today we will journey around the chart and I'll describe the signs from an esoteric point of view. I will hint at the soul purpose, but you are much more complex than one sign. Um, and today I'm going to do something a little different because I have Uranus near my midheaven <laughs> in the ninth house. Um, I'm going to start with Pisces. And we're going to end with Aquarius at the risk of someone in the far future listening to this and this part not making sense. I'm going to include the um, the energies of the current August 2022 uh, astrological chart. There is some significant events uh, in the sky that are happening now that I did include in the lecture. So even in this re-recording, I'll continue that as well. And we'll paste in the questions that were answered towards the end as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about the slides that you're going to be looking at. I've created a lot of graphics on them. You notice the symbol for the sign and the dates of the sign. Um, and then the animal or there's other kinds of representations for the sign that are in that middle section. And then to the left, we have the exoteric ruler, the planet, 
And to the right, we have the esoteric ruler. And you'll also see the glyphs for those planets on top of the planets that I have on the left and the right. So lots to absorb, and I hope that that is beneficial for you. But I will focus on the alignment of the soul using esoteric astrology as we go through the signs. Okay, good. Let's get started. <laughs> so we'll start with Pisces. And we're going to start with the meditation. I want you to please close your eyes and take in a deep breath. And just let go on the out breath and relaxing down. Good. Let's do that again. Just letting go in through the nose. Relaxing those belly muscles and filling it with air all through the lungs and letting go. And as we do that one more time, breathing in and out, I want you to imagine that you're in a forest, an ancient forest. And you found yourself in front of one of the tallest, widest trees in this ancient forest. And as you breathe in oxygen in through the nose. And as you breathe out your carbon dioxide, see that breath going towards the leaves of this tree as it breathes in your carbon dioxide and pulls that down into its trunk, down to its roots. And then imagining on the next in breath that you are pulling in the oxygen from this tree pulling in the oxygen into your body from this ancient tree. And on the out breath, open your heart and breathe out that carbon dioxide that the tree breathes in. And see it go down into the heart of this tree and see it breathe out the carbon the oxygen that you then breathe in, in through your nose and begin to see this breath in and out of you to in and out of the tree in a figure eight or a lemniscat in and out the infinity symbol of this breath and imagine as you breathe in and out from you to the tree, from the tree to you, you expand that breath to the whole forest and all of the trees are at one, breathing out the oxygen that you then breathe in as you breathe out the carbon dioxide that they all breathe in. And you can imagine everyone that's listening and has listened to this recording, all joining in to this breath in and out as you become one with the tree and the breath continues through its natural rhythm, flowing and supporting you, supporting all of the ancient forests, supporting this group of listeners, and it expands to the globe. And as you breathe out and the tree breathes in the carbon dioxide, it goes down its trunk and down into the earth as the earth then breathes out and you become the earth as well. 
and this flows up into the sky and down through your crown, all the way down through your body, down your feet, into the earth, into the roots of all of the trees as they exhale and feed the atmosphere that moves into the stars as you begin to dissolve into the oneness of the light of the rays of the stars as you are just an energetic beam conducting light from the earth and moving up and up connecting your energy and that of the trees and that of those who are on this call and listening to this lecture at all times in space and becoming one as you float up, up with the consciousness of all that is and allowing yourself to just exist and be free of any form at all allowing yourself to rise up and feel the peace and love and joy of the universe floating and breathing just existing as that energetic being that you are and on the next in breath breathe in through your crown Fill your lungs, come back into your body fully and completely and ground down just like a tree into your roots, coming fully back into your body. And that is the oneness of Pisces. (laughs) That is the experience of letting go that Pisces knows so well incredibly compassionate and sensitive the ruler exoteric ruler that is is neptune and this compassion and sensitivity is all aspects of neptune there is an incredible imaginal experience that pisces can have in fact as the creator of all that is and awareness of what that is there is an, a wonderful ability to imagine And there's a lot of power in that. And speaking of power, the esoteric ruler is Pluto. Pluto is known to be the ruler of Scorpio. And um, it is known for transformation. It is known for death and regeneration. And the alignment of the soul is to find out how you can sacrifice the self and understand so many different things so deeply and also work to transform the world and to serve humanity through that Pisces energy in the esoteric level. How can you serve humanity and change the world? Now, Pisces is a mutable sign. It really likes to go with the flow. You've got the fish that just continue to flow and move in this circular breath and energy, just like with the trees and letting go. And with Pluto as the esoteric planet, it is a non-sacred planet. And let me just back up to talk about that for one second. Non-sacred planets are, according to the esoteric astrology teachings of Alice Bailey and the Ageless Wisdom of H.P. Blavatsky, planets that still have lessons to learn. And in as a representation in our chart, they're working out some stuff. <laughs> and as we also work out some stuff through them, We're actually supporting their evolution just as they are supporting ours. It again, this Pisces idea of the synchronicity of above and below. So 
with Pluto as the esoteric ruler of Pisces, we have a significant energy of change and transformation. There is a continual growth and evolution. Pluto and Scorpio in particular, we'll talk about this later, but you know, there's three symbols for Scorpio. There is the scorpion, there is the eagle and the phoenix. And so that is a representation in and of itself of this ongoing evolution through the challenges that a Pisces rising sign, a Pisces individual, a strong Neptune individual is going to have through their life. And it's this always growing and evolving. And there's so much compassion. And again, how can you serve humanity? Your soul came in to understand the depths, the deep, deep depths of this experience. And we do that through challenges in this duality existence. All right. Let's move on to Aries, shall we? Speaking of duality and this existence and the human experience, we all know that, well, we might not all know, but if you've studied astrology at all, then you know Mars is the ruler of Aries and Mars is the god of war. Well, the first thing I want to say about that is how has that really served us to be as individuals, to be the light of who we are and the energetic beings that we are thinking that we have to fight for everything? We have to let go of the idea that Mars and Aries, because it is so dominant and fierce, is only about war. And Aries, similarly, really has to just be free to move and act and be the will that it is. It is about being the light of life itself. Allowing yourself like the seed of that tree. Does that seed need to be told what to do? It ingrained in the life force that it is, that seed knows exactly what it needs to do. Your soul's intention was to come here and just move forward. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. And there's everything to say that your power is essential in what you need to express in this lifetime, in this time, right now. This is very important because the esoteric ruler is Mercury. And you'd think that Mercury is about thinking, but it's really about that power of manifesting with the mind and controlling to some extent the ideas so that you can create the world in front of you. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that rams, the actual creatures, they have terrible eyesight. <laughs> So I think it's really interesting that, you know, the, the animal that represents the sign, the ram, also can't see very well. So, you know, we're going to leave behind the war and the old exoteric view of Aries and that initial light of life itself. That is what the esoteric vision of your soul wants to do if it's strong in your chart. All right. Now, let's go on to Taurus the goddess of love, exoteric ruler is Venus. And Venus likes her things. She wants to collect and pull things around her. She wants to build. It is the first earth sign of the zodiac and she is an incredible builder. Sometimes building is understanding. Um, it doesn't have to be an actual uh, structure, it can be building a group or building a corporation. Value is what Taurus is about. And that can be value from your pocketbook to your self esteem. These are all Taurian ideas and ideals. And the esoteric ruler is Vulcan. And the interesting part of esoteric astrology is that it is continually growing and evolving itself. And we don't actually, as you know, probably we haven't figured out where Vulcan is in the sky. It's not identified as a planet. And yet esoteric 
the esoteric ruler of Taurus is Vulcan. So what does that say about the evolution of humanity itself, that a sign Taurus has an esoteric ruler that isn't actually identified yet? What kind of evolution are we on where we have yet to understand our true value? Now, Vulcan is the blacksmith of the gods. It takes that power of Aries, of that will, and it brings it forth into manifestation of the light of consciousness itself. So where Venus, as the ruler of Taurus, exoterically is very much about the things or the corporations that you're that she's building. Vulcan is saying, what does spirit want me to build? What is the power of that understanding that is possibly unseen, that is unknown, but that I can channel through in order to build the next thing, manifest the spirit. Gemini. We've already talked a little bit about Mercury, um, but Mercury is the exoteric ruler of, of Gemini, the twins. Gemini is expansive and it wants to include all the things, all of the ideas. In fact, it is an insatiable desire to know more things. If you have Gemini strong in your chart, then this would resonate. Gemini, the twins, is esoterically ruled by Venus that sacred planet that knows love in Venus, it brings it into the heart. And with the twins being a fantastic representation of this duality existence, what does it mean to find that union of self and soul? With Venus as the esoteric ruler of Gemini, there is an embodiment of all of those beautiful, luscious experiences that we can have on a daily basis into the heart to transcend the mercurial existence and allow the manifestation of the soul in this lifetime. Cancer. Cancer is our first water sign in the zodiac. We've gone through Aries of fire, Taurus is earth, Gemini is air, and Cancer is the first water sign. So it is foundational. And the sign itself is foundational. The fourth house is representative of Cancer. So it is the bottom of the chart, the very essence of the inner point of who you are. Now, exoteric ruler is the moon. And um, the moon is, uh, as we know, in esoteric astrology, sort of this been there, done that. Things are very comfortable. It's time to move on. It's a malefic. There's a lot of holding on to the past with cancer. It absorbs like water. It feels, it intuits. Neptune is the esoteric ruler of cancer. And when I think of Neptune, just, you know, we had to let go. There was nothing that I really logically kind of put forth for you. It was about letting go and letting yourself dissolve. And cancer wants to hold on because there's so much here. There's, there's so much to nurture. There's so many things that I could be taken care of. It is the mother. It is that foundational part. Cancers know how to take care of everything. Maybe not so much themselves because there's so much to do and they're so psychic and eager to support others. And Neptune un needs to bring in that idea that you can love and nurture others responsibly and you can let go, that you can't control the other as much as you'd like to. And you can't do everything until your well is filled. And here we have our ferocious kitty, Leo playing, jumping, enjoying the creative act of just being. 
okay, this isn't the official lion necessarily, but creativity and that childlike innocence is so very important to Leo, as well as this representation of Leo, of just relaxing and being the light that you are knowing that every moment is about you. <laughs> and this is the essence of Leo, ruled by the sun. Again, a non-sacred luminary. But, and what that means is that there's challenges still. We're helping our sun by living in this energy of play and joy and understanding it, that we're helping it evolve and grow, but we have to play. If you have watched cats or have cats of your own, they really know how to chill. They are the best teachers of how to find a sunny spot and just chill out, be seen. And in fact, if you don't see them, they'll be mad, mad at you, right? So that's the other thing about Leo is that it is important, like the sun, we have to shine. We have to be seen. And the sun is the, both the exoteric and the esoteric ruler of Leo. You know, you want people to look at you. That is the esoteric goal. <laughs> so simple. But to play and to be all of who you are. Wait, so is exoteric and esoteric the sun? They are. The exoteric and esoteric are both the sun and as a non-sacred luminary in esoteric astrology. I mean, I love that idea that we, our energy to be that light, to be that shining star that is the light of the universe. I mean, it kind of goes back to that original imaginal experience where we are one and the same, right? So Virgo is uh, the second earth sign and the exoteric ruler is Mercury. In Virgo, similar to the first earth sign of Taurus, it is a builder. In fact, Virgo understands systems really well. It knows exactly what needs to happen and when it needs to happen. And it's not afraid to make it happen. Um, Virgo, in uh, at the time of the year that Virgo is, it's the time of the harvest, right? So being born at that time of the year, there's this knowledge of I, I have to, I have to make sure the, the fields are, you know, plowed and then I have to cultivate the seeds and I have to take all of the harvest and I have to, to put it in, uh, I have to can it and I have to preserve it and I have to make sure that my family is fed and then make sure that the community is fed and then there has to be some left over and then I have to make sure that the seeds are in the right spot so that next year and then we have to plow. There's a lot to do in Virgo, isn't there? And Mercury is there to communicate what that is. Now, the esoteric ruler is the moon. Often, Virgo gets so bogged down in all the details that there is a need to absorb emotionally, both for themselves as well as others. Allow that cultivation of the emotions and the nurturing of themselves as much as others and to heal others. So the, the interesting part about Virgo, there's a lot of healers in Virgo because we're, they're so adept at understanding the systems of what's going on in the body. Um, and that moon as the esoteric ruler allows that light of the sun to absorb into it and to be bright. And the other thing about the moon that I didn't mention before was that to be bright in your own house, the house is very important to the moon. So rather than going out and doing all the things and making sure of it, just find your space at home, find the center of who you are and allow yourself so just be there for a while. Be with yourself, Virgos. Feel what you need to feel. So in the chart, if you imagine the circle, all of the signs that we've been through, they correlate with the houses. And so they are part of this 
um, sort of underground inner part of the individuation of the self. You know, we can imagine the seed and then it has the surroundings and then it starts to communicate with the world and recognizes that it has a mother and there's nurturing going on. And then it pops up with these above the ground. It says, oh, look at me and the Leo energy. And then that Virgo is like, oh, I got to do stuff. Okay, I'll do stuff. And now we move to the descendant, which is on the horizon on the other side of the planet at the time you were born and the setting, the West, right? So what's coming into you and Libra is the sign on the seventh house uh, and it has to do with relationships. So you now recognize all of that development and individuation of who you are so that you can partner so that you can mix and mingle and you can have fun. It is an air sign. It loves, it's ruled by Venus. So there's that love nature right there. It absolutely wants to connect with relationships. And when I say relationships, that is beyond just individuals, partners, even business relationships. We are in relationship. I am in relationship with Zoom right now, hopefully. And, you know, we are in relationship with everything. So balance the scales. The sign for Libra is very, very important. And as an air sign, it can think a lot about that. Its esoteric ruler is Uranus. We haven't talked about Uranus yet, um, but Uranus is a sacred planet. So it's sort of the big brother of Mercury in the sense that it is a higher vibration. It is also the planet that rules Aquarius. Uranus is the Akash. Uranus is the information that is a part of, that's directly up that onto Karana and, and you are connected. And so through Libra, there is this expansiveness that not to get bogged down in the everyday relationships of Zoom or relationships, work, people, things, but to rise above and understand the greater picture. We are all being Libra in esoteric rulership now as we as we seek to understand what our soul's relationship with the world is so this is libra as an esoteric view is to receive and you may not understand and libra does not like to not understand it wants to balance and weigh everything and it understands a lot but in uranus it is allowing more information to come through and trusting that so moving on to scorpio you know, there are three symbols for Scorpio and we have the scorpion and then we have the eagle and then we have the phoenix. For Scorpio, the exoteric ruler is Mars. Well, so before Pluto was discovered, Mars was the ruler of Scorpio. When Pluto was discovered, they have this sort of dual relationship. Mars, we talked about that, right? The scorpion works a little bit with that exoteric idea of Mars we want to move away from that warlike energy, but there's a lot of fighting with others that happens with Scorpio just because it's so complicated and so intense. It's very typical for Scorpio children to be abandoned or rejected or something within the first couple years of their life. Some kind of maybe it's emotional abandonment. Someone doesn't have to leave, but there's always this really intense relationships that I trusted you. And I couldn't trust you. And that's what Scorpio has come to understand is that why did I come into this world as a soul to not trust people? What does my soul need to know about that? And it's interesting because the esoteric ruler is Mars, but we're not talking about the warlike Mars anymore. We are talking about the Phoenix that rises from those ashes and understands as it becomes the light of life itself, where to fly. It can rise up to see what is possible and what felt like was it was impossible. Sagittarius, it is a whole centaur and he's holding the bow and arrow and he's shooting up into the stars. The exoteric ruler is Jupiter. 
Sagittarius is interested in big ideas, in philosophical ideas, and it understands them really well. It's a great teacher and um, and it wants to experience the world with all four legs moving all the time. And once it goes to one direction, then it gets excited about this other direction. And there can be many different projects. The exoteric ruler Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. So that's representative of the big ideas that that Sagittarians have and the big the big projects that they'll take on. The esoteric ruler, and this is something I love about esoteric astrology, is Earth. Other than astrology charts mainly being geocentric here on the Earth, it it doesn't, we don't include in traditional astrology, we don't include the Earth, but in esoteric astrology in Sagittarius, Earth is the ruler of the sign. So as you go out and shoot for the stars, let's come back to earth and teach the rest of us how to do what you've learned. Teachers don't just read a book. They go out and experience the world and, and experience the cosmos and expand so that we can come back to earth to fully inhabit in the body, not being out there, <laughs> bring it down to the earth, bring it down fully all the way to those beautiful ancient chakras in your feet so that you are connected here now and focused. The point is Sagittarius esoterically is to bring the information back with the focus, but collecting all of it. Capricorn is exoterically ruled by Saturn and esoterically ruled by Saturn. You always hear about the goat. Traditionally, even in ancient astrology, they used the sea goat. And I prefer to look at the sea goat myself. Saturn is a planet that is about karma. It's about reality. Saturn is a planet and Capricorn is the sign that in your chart, it gets real. You came to do some real serious stuff in Capricorn, wherever it is in your chart. You're keeping it real. There's ambition. It's the, um, it's the third earth sign. So it also is a builder. It's a leader um, in the chart. It is at the top of the chart. So the 10th house of career is ruled by Capricorn. And so Capricorn is all about being serious. Now, we've all been serious at one time or another, or had some situations that were pretty serious, that Saturn. And what did you learn from those experiences? That's why we came here. We came here to experience duality with the rulership of Saturn. Capricorn is somewhere in your chart so that we can understand what loss is. And while Scorpio has to do a transformation, Capricorn deals with death. It's intense. Things end and they grow anew because you have to move on. You have to climb that ladder. There is so much ambition in Capricorn. And when you're experiencing those deaths, you grieve. And that's also part of Capricorn. Saturn's known as a malefic because <laughs> it's so darn hard. But allowing that death and making sure that you feel into the depths of the waters of who you are. It is a earth sign, but with the sea goat, there is a really intense transformational experience that happens when we grieve. In fact, we open up to new ways of understanding the world. Mys mysterious experiences happen when someone around you dies. You might see them in a dream, or you may see them in real life, or you may start to see other aspects. There's something about grief in particular that isn't typically associated with Capricorn. It's, you know, the ambition and working hard and you got all your shit together. But really, Capricorn is using that ambition towards the highest good and through the integrity of the heart because that death really brings you into your heart and into the waters of the world itself. Aquarius, this is the last sign that we're gonna look at today because we started with Pisces. The exoteric ruler similar to um, Scorpio. Um, before Uranus was discovered, the exoteric ruler of Aquarius was Saturn. We just talked about Saturn. You can apply all of that to Aquarius. And then Uranus, 
became the exoteric ruler once it was discovered. The esoteric ruler is Jupiter. And of course, there's a bell when we talk about Jupiter. <laughs> because everything happens with Jupiter. Um, and Jupiter is a sacred planet. And I will go back and say Saturn is also a sacred planet. So there's much knowledge in both of those. And Aquarius is, we'll go back to Uranus, what we were talking about before. It is the Akash. It is the genius of our existence that we understand things in a very different way. And it's hard to, to understand things that you can't always talk about in that you don't really understand what the heck you're understanding. You can't communicate what that is. It's such a high level vibration and energy that, you know, Aquarius is, is receiving a lot of information. Aquarius rules the internet. Are we receiving a lot of information and is it erratic or what? There's so much that we are getting now as we move into this age of Aquarius. And if you have Aquarius strong in your chart, you are receiving that information all the time. And it can be in many different ways, but as an air sign, it's the information that is energetic in everything that is. And, and Aquarians understand this. And the, the journey for the soul in Aquarius is to push it more <laughs> with ruler Jupiter esoterically, is to make it bigger, make it greater, bring the information, go and do more things, serve humanity in the ways that you have brought your genius to this lifetime as an Aquarius. I wanted to just briefly touch on uh, some of the energies in the world that are happening now. It's really intense. There's a big red X in the middle. That's because it's intense. So, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you this. You, you can feel it, right? It's intense out there. It's not only hot, but there's a lot going on. Right now, we have the sun and Mercury and Leo. Um, we also have opposing that. Saturn and Aquarius. Mercury is, you know, how we are creating this world. The way that we are imagining our world is how it is created. And with the sun coming to a conjunction with that in Leo, it is important to be seen. It is important to shine and it is important to manifest the energies as you want them. So be careful of how you're thinking. You know about the law of attraction, I'm sure. You know, the vibration that you are putting out through your mind and your thoughts is really important with the sun conjunct Mercury in Leo and making sure that that is the highest vibration that, that could possibly be there. That is opposed Saturn and Aquarius. Saturn is the real deal. I call it the playpen that Mother Nature puts her children in. So don't touch that. Be careful over there. Don't do that. Restrictions, limitations, and also responsibility. Once you can step out of that playpen, you know not to touch the hot stove, right? You're responsible for yourself and maybe others in Saturn. Saturn's asking us to take responsibility for the genius that we have brought individually and collectively to this lifetime right now. So there's a pressure for all us light workers and individuals, however you identify, to say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is where my light can be brought and my energy can shine and my thoughts can manifest with the new Aquarian age. Allowing the information that is coming from above and it's alien. You can take that in all respects right? Whatever alien ideas or energies you want to bring down into the, world, into the world, Saturn is helping you to manifest it. Or it can be government trying to control the different disparities between states or countries. There's all kinds of other representations. So there's this opposition between, I will shine my light and I will create as I think I need to. And then there's this opposition of but who are you now and what are you going to do that's new and different and erratic and totally different from anything you've ever done? Now, that 
is square Uranus, Mars, and the North Node in Taurus. So I've talked about all those things except for the North Node and just to point out that that is opposing the South Node. So in a different kind of an astrology, uh, evolutionary astrology, the nodes are aspects of the sun and the moon and the ecliptic, and they are karmic points. They're not uh, objects, they're points in the sky, geometric points that uh, the south node is, is a trauma that your soul came here to deal with again. And the north node is your karmic destiny. There's uh, astrologer Stephen Forrest laid it out like the south node is the bottle. The north node is the meeting. What really needs to happen right now with Uranus at 18 degrees of Taurus, Mars at 18 degrees of Taurus, North Node at 18 degrees of Taurus, is it's time to act on the new energy that says, I got my karmic destiny. I know what to do and I know who I am and I know what I value now in this new framework of who I am. These are all in, in opposite Scorpio in the South Node. Um, you know, there's a lot of pain and suffering that it's time to let go. That is the bottle for the collective society that we are as, as humanity. There's a lot of resentment. There's a lot, all of those lower level energies take it. This is where we bring in the lower level Mars energy, all of the warlike energy, all of, you know, the resent, the, um, the, the pain, however it wants to manifest itself, that needs to be released and poured into the earth to be transformed. That is the North Node in Taurus. Allow the earth to support you. But we also have to take responsibility and allow this new consciousness that we are and act on this new consciousness that is of a new value. We have to create new values. So the Scorpio South Node is um, the South Node is a point in the sky and it's energetically saying that collectively we have to let go of the past that was that harmed us and all of the people in that that harmed us. And the North Node, Mars and Uranus are opposing that. So what's happening is that maybe energetically, emotionally duck in those past emotions, feeling them intensely, feeling like there's not enough supply chain issues, right? Mm -hmm. There's not enough like love. There's not, that. that's all South Node in Scorpio. I'm not, they're not gonna be able to take care of me. Think of the child that's two that gets taken away from their parents or abandoned. Like there's no one there to support them. Those are all South Node in Scorpio emotions that collectively we're processing and our karmic destiny is to go towards the values of this new life that you are. And Uranus is bringing the information that is alien to us. It's new. It's a collective movement towards humanity living together peacefully is really what Aquarius. And that, is that not genius? <laughs> but also it is square. So it's called the Grand Cross. I don't know if some of you have heard about Mars and Uranus and North Node and Taurus that it's, you know, conjunct and there's a lot of sensationalizing that's going on because Taurus is an earth sign. So there are earthquakes, whatever. I'm not saying that those things haven't happened. It, it just they had an earthquake in the Philippines the other day. Mm -hmm. Right. But the, the real energy that we need to go to that meeting that's opposite from the bottle in Scorpio, that meeting is about finding the stability within yourself and allowing this new information and new values to come forth. That is this place, that is this community. Aquarius and Uranus really want to move forward. They're demanding that we move forward in new ways. And especially with Mars conjunct Uranus, this is action, it's unexpected. And in Taurus, all of these are fixed signs to Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, all fixed signs. So just like the word fixed, they have definite ideas about the way that things need to be done. And so we're in this sort of stalemate. 
And this will move. And especially with Uranus and Mars in Taurus, it's going to move forward in new ways that can be. And we get to choose because we are the creators and we are all working with Mercury somewhere in our chart. In fact, right now, Mercury is in Leo. And so how can we shine our light and also include others while that light is bright and unique and different? <laughs> Q&A. Uh, there's a few people left online. I'm sad they're not all here, but um, we did what we could. Thank you for hanging in there, you guys. I'm glad to see there's a few left. Um, Q and A. Yes. In in general, um, yeah. With esoteric astrology, I assume that um, there's a relational way of looking at the signs together and. Um, when you do that, are you looking at this um, or ruin kind of that you had down? When I read a chart? When you're doing a relational type of chart. Trying to understand, I will. So when I do relational, tell me that again. If you, if you and this is assuming you do, um, Charts, yes. Two or more. Oh, looking at that. got it. So comparing two charts of two different people. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. in, in esoteric astrology, mm -hmm. um, I'm really paying a lot of attention to the esoteric planet down here because that's new to me. And, um, yeah. Does that figure in a lot to how you're looking at the relational? Um, aspects yeah so the question is um when and if i look at two charts together to see how they match up am i including the esoteric rulers mm -hmm. in that relational the answer is yes to all of that so but there's so much in an individual's chart that is about them i really want to focus on who they are and what their journey is but we are here to have relationships with everything, including Zoom and, <laughs> and each other, right? So, um, so I will definitely um, take someone else's information and, and I look at it in the way where they can apply how they are being affected. My person I'm working with, how they are affected by someone else and really focus on them. So it's not going into the other person's chart that isn't there that may not have agreed to have their chart read. Well, interestingly, what I'm thinking of is I'm a twin. Oh. There's a lot alike. In the yeah. chart, we have different rising signs. Oh. And so it's interesting. Yeah. And we looked at that at a time. My sister's very into astrology. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating. So, that. I think regarding that, and twins are fascinating to read their charts. You know, when I'm reading a chart, I'm picking up energetic signatures of the soul. I'm open to their guides coming and sharing. I'm just saying, I'm happy to be a vehicle for this individual to share what they need to hear in this moment. And I often don't, you know, I know the charts, but I'm open to where that's at. And that I think is connecting with the soul of that person, mm -hmm. connecting with our guides and with their path that's individual. And it's amazing how it can be different. Um, but there are, there's different levels of individuation for the soul. Uh, as you know, not everyone is the same, even though you're born on the same day within probably minutes or maybe, Yeah fascinating that your rising signs are different that's beautiful each of you chose that individual time so that the rising sign is different shifts the the way i like to say um, go back to the chart a little bit is so there's the circle uh, we talked about the rising sign is on the eastern horizon and then the first house goes around to the 12th house so each of those houses is the stage the planet's in the houses is the actor on that stage, that section of life that is that stage. And the sign the planet is in is the script that uh, that actor reads. So even though nearly everything is the same because your houses shifted a little bit, you've moved um, those actors to some extent, not much, 
not even the moon moves very far in 10 minutes, but um, yeah. So those, that's the shift that would happen, but there's other uh, evolutionary soul growth that um, happens for each individual too. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yes. I'm interested in sort of the difference between us. Um, some of them have the same exo and esoteric uh, planet, mm -hmm. and some of them are most of them are different. I just find that really fascinating that sort of the external lesson or plan is either mirrored or, or there's a complementary. I don't know, I just wondered if you could expand on that. Yeah. Um, there's a shadow and a light to everything, right? So, um, what is, you know, for the, I think it's the sun and Saturn, both that have the same, uh, exoteric and so Leo and Capricorn. Um, and so what about the energy of the sun? Is it going to scorch the earth and burn as the Leo that you are, or can you really bring in all of the, the heart that is part of Leo. Um, and I also think it's really beautiful that the sun is a non-sacred planet. That we, as we evolve wherever the sun is in our chart and wherever Leo is, that we're supporting the evolution of that planet. So in esoteric astrology and lots of, uh, in fact, probably everything that is part of the ageless wisdom from Blavatsky and Alice Bailey is that everything is evolving with us. And so um, part of, I mean, Saturn can get really depressed. <laughs> I don't know if any, any Capricorns in here, but it's a lot to deal with. There's a lot of BS that happens when Saturn is on top of your Venus. It's probably not good for your relationships. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but, you know, but, but to really value that journey as, as a soul, that we came here to experience that duality and, and the higher vibration of, of Capricorn and Saturn is to really love that pain and not in a, not in a way where you're creating pain for yourself, but, but to value the depths of that and then to recognize on the other side of it that I was missing the love. I was missing the love and that is but I think Saturn and Capricorn, you know, that evolution of the planet that um, to love all of the, the pain as well as the joy without the, the shadow of the pain, we wouldn't know the joy to its fullest extent. And Saturn will show you. <laughs> it's really interesting. I feel like the sun and Saturn are both very like absolute energies in a way, like, like the, the limitations, the hard edge of Saturn and the fact just unbounded expansiveness and so both. And I'm like not surprised they didn't want to share. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh, did I hope I didn't have second raise? Oh good. Okay. I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah. Except just say yes, Mariana. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for the presentation. I heard you say a couple of times this uh, phrase, non-sacred sign or non-sacred planet. What does that mean? Could you elaborate a little bit? Sure. So in esoteric, in the teachings of uh, Alice Bailey, they and Blavatsky possibly as well, um, they have defined the planets that are sacred and that are non-sacred. Um, so the sacred planets are essentially the ones that have sort of gone through their journey. And so they can be the bigger brother or bigger sister. They've, they've really come to their fullest understanding and evolution of who and what they're here to do. And the non-sacred luminaries and planets are they're still on their journey. And it's not that everything isn't evolving, but in esoteric astrology, there is this sense that there are some that still have work to do in order to get through to their full expansion of what they're supposed to do. And so when those planets are significant in your chart and where they are, because all of them are somewhere in your chart, um, 
then, you know, that's, that's an energy for you as well. So that you can understand, okay, I have the full sacred evolved experience of Venus here. And this, and this Leo energy over here that I have, you know, whatever planet in, I, I'm still working on that evolution of that sun, that Leo energy in my life. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, so you went over mostly the um, almost like a remapping of the ones, but what else is like, and we've covered like sacred signs or sacred planets, but like, is that basically the intro of it, so to speak, of like the esoteric is like remapping plus some sacred signs stuff, or is there like a, a really you know what I mean? Is there more? more? Oh, there's a ton more. So I think the question is, um, you know, we've gone through the signs and talked about the planets. I didn't talk about the houses very much. I mean, there's so there's a shadow and a light for everything. Um, this is a basic, but I hope kind of comp it's not comprehensive at all. Um, you know, there's there's a lot more. Um, did I get that question right? Yeah, like basically, I'm like, okay, so so we have the shadow and light, and, and I guess that would imply in, that everything that is exoteric has an esoteric one, but is there like new, like totally different paradigms in the esoteric thing that aren't like covered in exoteric, right? Like, you know what I mean? Because we're here we remap, which is fair enough, but then is there like a whole like different, I don't know, like, sign or do they use different constellations? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, it's, or houses are they're totally conceptually different category that's not in normal astrology. I don't know if that makes sense. See what I, mean? I think that so. The question for online is: uh, Is there more? But is there new concepts, philosophies um, that are part of the esoteric astrology that aren't part of exoteric astrology? And so, for instance, yes, Earth is included in esoteric astrology where it's not other than we're born here in exoteric. Um, and then there's these other ideas that there, well, Vulcan isn't actually identified yet, right? So it's including um, the, mis the mystery. The esoteric is including the mystery. And there is so much more that I don't know, not because I haven't studied it, which I haven't, but even if I had, I just like the evolution of, each of us and the planets and the earth itself, there's things constantly changing and evolving. And this is part of the age of Aquarius. So like I said, when I started, trust your instincts. And just because I say something, especially if you have a Pisces rising sign, you know, just understand that there's so much more that, that is evolving and that we will expand to. Yes. Um, I don't know how to frame this as a question. That's more like a comment. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I studied the esoteric astrology book years ago, what I found helpful in it was clues and things that were just amazingly significant that would turn up. And you couldn't always explain why they were appropriate. But here's one that occurred to me while you were talking about Virgo. And I'm not Virgo. I have nothing there, which is generational, but it is opposite Pisces, then. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, I did have a Virgo girlfriend years ago, but a uh, long time ago. But um, Chick Flick, soap opera, but it's called Heart of Dixie. It's, I don't know if anybody here ever saw it, but it is really fascinating. And um, the woman who plays the doctor in it is Rachel Bilson. And I looked up her uh, date, and she's a son in Virgo. Okay, so she plays a doctor in the, and you'll find that actors and actresses always play parts that they're appropriate, are appropriate to their birth chart. Mm. So she plays a doctor who goes down south. She's from New York City, Jewish, and she goes down there and she wants to be a surgeon, a heart surgeon. She's trained for that, but she is told she needs to do some general practitioner work. So she goes to this place in Alabama, a little town to do GP work. She doesn't want to. Okay, what is interesting is you said the esoteric ruler is Mercury, which would be the heart surgeon. She said, 
I just want to do, I don't even want to know my patients. I want to just do the work, you know, the technical work of doing the heart surgery. Mercury, you know, the technology. But you said the esoteric earlier is the moon. I had forgotten that. Oh. Now, this makes perfect sense because what did she do? The whole series is partly about how she adjusts to doing this general practitioner work. And then she does fall in love with it, falls in love with the town, the people of the town, her mm-hmm. patients who come in with minor illnesses. And she decides she wants to be a general practitioner. So this was moving from the exoteric mercury to the esoteric moon. And this is in a... TV series, you know. Uh, and this was called The Heart of Dixie? Heart of Dixie is the name Dixie. Of the name is H-A-R-T, Dr. H-A-R-T. So it's kind of a play on words, Heart of Dixie. But uh, it's, it's a rom-com. It's fun to watch <laughs> for me, even, even though I say it's a trick, like I'm sort of embarrassed that I enjoy it so much, but it's a lot of love affairs and stuff. But the, the, <laughs> the thing about that was funny that you said Mercury to Moon, and that's exactly what she was doing, and she's a Virgo. Virgo. So if you want, for those online, um, if you didn't hear that, then if you want to learn more about the journey of Virgo through Mercury to the moon from exoteric to esoteric, then you can watch Heart, H-A-R-T of Dixie. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yes, Andrew, please. (laughs) Thank you. So first of all, amazing talk. Uh, Thank you. Luminous, as I guess we would come to expect from you, from your previous sharings. So my final slide, because gratitude, peace, and a fun emoji heart is what I leave you with. (laughs) Thank you so much, Nicole. It was an amazing presentation. And Thank um, you. Oh, there, there's there's Athena. Okay, I just wanted to Athena make sure you mention about what's coming up, the coming attraction for uh, for Nicole. Oh, oh, I mention wanted to the coming attraction, the coming <laughs> attractions for Nicole. Um, yeah, Nicole in November um, is going to be doing a presentation on Hilma off Clint and her journey as an artist and bringing all of that together. Um, and it'll definitely be in person here. And I'm debating about whether we will do that as a zoom hybrid or do something that we record and then share to YouTube. Um, so more to come. Uh, And then just in general for August, we'll have our um, meditations Saturday and Sunday, Sunday, our hybrid one Saturday, just here with Greg or Linda, Um, but no other presentations library will be open. Come on down. Um, Yeah. And after Labor Day, we'll get rolling with more regular presentations on Sunday. Again, we'll decide if we want those to be hybrid or not. Um, Yeah, yeah, more to come. Check our website. Yes, Mariana. I was still doing the Monday night workshops as Andrew. Oh, thank you, Mariana. Yes, Andrew's doing those Monday nights. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there.